Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of No Reserve, Haggerty's podcast about the enthusiast car market. Now we're here to help you make sense of the market, whether you're buying, selling, or simply watching. Now this week we're talking about the rise of the Gen Xers in the enthusiast car community. A massive deal on a Highland Green Mustang, neoclassic cars are sort of made to look like pre-war machines, and also we have a really fierce debate about the merits of the Honda S2000. I'm Larry Webster, editor of Haggerty Media, and I'm joined by Dave Kinney. He's the publisher of the Haggerty Price Guide. And we've got decades of experience buying, selling, and driving the cars we love. Plus, we're not just guessing at the values, we're backed by the data of the Haggerty Valuation Tools. All right, Dave, let's get right into it. We're recording this on Monday, May 15th, a little bit earlier. There's, uh, We're just seeing real signs of summer here in Michigan. I think people are really getting excited about getting their cars out. They're starting to buy. So let's just jump right into a story that was on insider.haggerty.com where our data has hit a huge milestone. And I know you track this really closely, but the milestone was the number of quotes that come into Haggerty Insurance. They're quoting for um, enthusiast car insurance. So the number of Gen X quotes surpassed the number of baby boomer quotes for the first time. This is a big deal, right? Yeah, I'm going to have to play the rest of this uh, podcast under protest because it's an <laughs> official baby boomer. You know, as you are aware, we rule the world. We make the no rules. No more, Dave. We're and, coming for you. Get off my lawn, Lawrence. Get off my <laughs> lawn. No, I, it's a great thing to see, actually. It's a fantastic thing because, you know, this is the one you show to your friends who say, oh, kids don't like cars anymore and all that sort of stuff. But a load of you know what. Yeah. Um, you know, we're seeing these quotes, uh, you know, by generation and we track them. It's pretty easy to track because you have to know how old your insured is. Uh, and it's a big, big deal. We knew this was going to happen, but here it is. It's happened. Um, you know, we are uh, baby boomers. I guess we will have to start getting off the lawn. Well, you know, uh, I mean, Dave, I, I mean, Every boomer except for you has a lot of knowledge to pass on to this next generation. So I hope you'll keep oh, that in mind. Oh, oh bird. <laughs> yeah, I know. That was pretty genius. But it, it also shows the millennials and Gen Z are ticking up. I mean, to your yep. point about the next generation being interested in cars, we're seeing more quotes than ever. And there are more younger people are coming to our door every year. This is not like a blip. This has been a long-term trend. It's certainly coming. I mean- what I liked about this piece on insider.haggerty.com, it just said, this really doesn't mean, it's not like, oh my gosh, it's really a, it's a point on a continuum, right? Yeah, like absolutely. Nothing. This is no, nothing's falling off a cliff. Nothing's, you know, uh, you know, exploding, yeah. but, the, but the, but the change is here and yeah. it's, it's actually come. Well, you know, what's interesting is that and along with like the, the age, they also know which kind of car that they're asking about. And their interest is super interesting about Gen Xers. I know those Radwood cars built after 1980, there's a lot more interest in that. But it's a lot of the same stuff that the boomers like. Corvettes, muscle cars, pony cars, 60 pickups. I mean, those things yep. are not necessarily going to fall off a cliff value-wise, are they? No. Um, you know, once again, you know, we always talked about this. Usability is such a big factor in what people buy oh. and actually use trucks. Great, you know, usability. These uh, uh, SUVs, same thing. You can actually get out there and use them. Um, it's not the car that sits in the garage that anybody wants anymore. It's the one that goes fast. It's the one that looks good and the one that has, you know, some sort of utility to it. So, uh, you know, it's, it, it continues on. i uh, like to see the uh, Aventador is uh, something that's, uh, you know, still... You know, uh, oh, well, winding that, people, that, winding spe people's that's watches. That's a little but, rich, Dave. I mean, those are so six-figure cars, know. right? Hey, you guys are taking all the money. All us boomers are dying. You guys are just <laughs> waiting for us boomers to croak so you can, uh, you know, move into that the good house and all that, and then fight with your brother and sister over who gets the money. But anyhow, Countach is another one that uh, resonates with Gen X. So there we are. Well, you pointed out a big trend is that one of the things that we're seeing, I know you guys are seeing at the Haggerty Evaluation Team, and that is this this popularity of vintage SUVs. I mean, um, and not just yeah. like the early first generation Broncos. I mean, I think this probably carries all the way into the 90s with any Land Cruiser that, you know, wasn't built in the last 20 years is doing pretty yeah. well value-wise. Yeah, Defenders, Jimmys, Blazers, yeah. uh, CJ8s, uh, Land Cruiser, FJ40s. I mean, they were all called out by this uh, by this article as well. I, you know, no big surprise there. Um, yeah, uh, but it is it is 
you know, uh, the more things change, the more they stay the same in some ways. Uh, of course, by the time the uh, Gen Xers are, you know, are, are given into the uh, uh, the millennials, they'll make another change as well. That's just the nature of the car world. It always has been, probably always will. But yeah, the next generation's coming to take over. And one of the we had another article on Haggerty.com about a car that is going to really sing for this generation. And I just want to talk about it because I haven't seen one sale. It's the Audi Ur Quattro. And uh, these are, I just love these cars. These are sort of the cars built in the early 80s that Audi built to go rally racing. They had a build back that era. Street cars that had the same mechanical uh, layout as the ones they wanted to race. So this is a, a coupe, big flared fenders, four-wheel drive, five-cylinder turbo. I, these things are super duper cool. Uh, I've never driven one. Have you ever been in one? Yeah, yeah, I have. Uh, a buddy of mine owned a shop who, uh, you know, I had a couple of them that were customers and they were new cars um the uh, when they were new cars you know they only made a small amount of them that came to the united states um and they've been available for the uh, you know for the 25 year import rule for quite some time um i love these cars i love the way they look rust is a, a huge issue on these cars oh. like most of the cars of this era but um you know they they're boxy and they boxy in a great way they've got uh, you know they've got the you know, the kind of flares and the, uh, you know, the respect that it goes with the kind of cladding on the bodywork, or not cladding, but the uh, uh, exaggerated bodywork that really, really looks good on these cars. Yeah, they sold 11,500. Only 664 came to the United States. And those, of course, were back then really watered down versions of this. Yep. We got the emission controls and all this various stuff. Our fuel wasn't as good, by yada, yada, yada. So, you really want the European model. Now, we were talking about this before the show, and, you know, you know, among my little group, we all recognize how cool these cars are, but you claim they're still bargains. Is this like a... Yeah. Should we oh, put yeah. this on the bull market this year, you think? Yeah, I think you should, because they're not a lot of them. That's the problem. But I, you know, my content... I, I really do think you can buy a really decent car for under 100000 Hey. And sometimes, in some cases, well under a hundred thousand. So there's not a lot of them out there. But when you find them, they don't go for as much as you you would think they would. Um, you know, compare it to the Lancia. Compare it to a lot of different cars that have, you know, kind of the, you know, the the rally thing going on. I mean, I know that's huge because we're talking WRX. We're at that point. We're talking all kinds of cars. But I think these things were, uh, you know, let's just put it this way. They were a little bit of the German granddaddy of a lot of these cars. Yeah, I think some of it, and we'll test this theory out, was because Audi also came out with a version called the Sport, the Audi Sport Quattro, which was had a right. foot shorter wheelbase. Yep. And they built a couple, uh, 400 of those, I think is what it was, to make it legal for rally competition. And that is the car and the competition version that you see in a lot of those, those uh, early 80s rally films versus... The Ur Quattro is a little longer, a little better street car for sure, but it doesn't have that same tie-in with those those videos. Fair? Yeah, fair enough, but I'll take the Ur Quattro over the Sport Quattro any day. Mm -hmm. um, I just think they're more versatile, uh, you know, for the kind of usage I would do. Uh, you know, the Ur Quattro is going to beat you up. I can't even imagine what the Sport Quattro is going to do when you're driving it, uh, unless you have the build of a rally driver, which is, generally speaking, someone... 31 years old, weighs 107 pounds and, you know, lifts weight for fun, lifts weights for fun, uh, you're probably going to be like tossed you. all over. Is that you? At, well, that was the old me, but the new me, I, <laughs> you know, I've gone luxury version. Uh, but any, anyhow. Uh, I like know, that. I'll I'm take, about the luxury I'll, version. Yes, thank you. I'll, I'll take either one of them. Don't get me wrong. But maybe for practical reasons, the Ur Quattro might be just as much fun you know, here's something that we haven't really talked about yet on this podcast. What? Is look at some of these cars that are coming up and becoming much more popular. You can talk Porsche. You can talk a number of different cars. It's the homologation cars that yeah. seem to be really taken off. Um, you know, homologation cars, for those who don't know what we're talking about, you know, a lot of times the manufacturer has to build 500 or 300 or 700 or 1,000 of these cars, you know, to prove that they built them so they can put them on the track. But I think... If you, uh, you know, we, we ought to have some uh, data here at some point where we can track pure homologation cars and see what they're doing in the marketplace. I know they're just so super cool. There's something about like there was a reason this thing existed, and that reason was to go racing. And yep. in the 80s, the, the sanctioning bodies were very strict about this. So, you know, the E30 M3, right? That was a homologation car. Uh -huh. The uh -huh. 2.3 16 
I forgot what the last of it. Mercedes was my favorite, which was never sold here. But you're right, the twenty you could potentially import is that Peugeot 205 T16. I mean, the industrial design of those things is super cool. I love those cars. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, <clears throat> Americans aren't big Peugeot fans, but we're missing out when we uh, when we don't take those into uh, into effect. So yeah, well, yeah, definitely. Dave, do me a favor. You find an Quattro, <laughs> Let's split it. It'll live here in Michigan. Whenever you want to come drive it, you're now, welcome you to. You always say split it and then live here in Michigan. <laughs> Okay, so there's a problem right there. I have better weather in Virginia than you do in Michigan. Listen, man, dude, like this is where you boomers, you just want to suck everything up. How about like just passing <laughs> it on to the next generation, helping my generation experience some of these great cars, you know, before, like while I still can. I mean, Dave, this is why I'm counting on you. Help a guy out. Okay, yeah. Well, to Larry, who I promised to leave in my will, hey, Larry, there's my acknowledgement. Okay, so- <laughs> Well, it's better anybody else. Okay, let's move on again to some of these <laughs> past sales because there was one that was really interesting that uh, we at Haggerty analyzed. It's a uh, 1968 Ford Mustang GT Coupe that yep. sold at uh, Mecham on April 15th. Now, bring the listeners up to speed on this car a little bit. I think you're, you're I hate to admit this, but you're a little more knowledgeable about these Mustangs. <laughs> well, right. Well, this is a 68 GT Coupe. Um, this one has uh, is Highland Green with gold. It has the 428 uh, 335 horse R code Cobra jet, big deal. Top loader, four speed. That's another big deal. Traction lock, uh, this, you know, deluxe it, Marty report. This was a, this was a car that has a past history that you don't see often right now. And that history is that it's sold on bring a trailer for almost twice as much and not to, oh, well, actually a little bit more than twice as much and not that long ago. So Whoa, what, what the heck's going on here? So in 2021, it sold for 100 grand on Bring a Trailer, and then yep. what's this? Two years later, wait, 20, 2023, 2000, that's two years, right? Okay, two yeah, years use later. Both fingers, good for there you. There you yeah, go. Okay, it yeah, sold forty nine five. Which yeah, that's a deal. I would have bought oh, yeah, that. That's, that's a deal. It was a great car for that money. What? What? Somebody must have yeah. needed to raise some cash, and they didn't put a reserve. Or what do you think happened here? Well, it could very well be. You know, we do we do track some cars that sold for more during the pandemic than they're selling for now. This is about as much as I've ever heard one going for. Now, you know, we'll never know the backstory on it. We'll never know what happened and the reasons why. But Highland Green with tan, vinyl interior, a really nice. I mean, if you, you know, have a chance to look under the hood of this thing, see some pictures, it is awesome looking. It's super cool. That's the thing. I mean, it has half a, price, a half price, black half price. vinyl roof, which, mm-hmm. yeah, maybe. Mm-hmm. But we should, take that off. we should explain. This is the top available engine in 68, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has a, a reasonable rear end ratio. So as we talked about, usable. Great, great mm-hmm. color. And then you should talk about this Marty report because that is a weird thing. It's a big deal. What is that? Okay, so Kevin Marty and his wife, whose name I can't remember right now, um, have all the Ford Motor Company records almost every year. They How did go they get back, that? They, did they steal those? No, 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 no. They made a deal with Mr. Ford himself. They made a deal a long time ago. And wow. Ford said, hey, we don't want to handle the history division, so we'll just source it out to you guys. Huh. And I know Kevin. He's a great guy. And what it is is you get a computer printout of what your car was. So it's not somebody's opinion of what your car was. You mean it's the not options? Somebody's- yeah, exactly. Okay. When it sold, where it sold, when it went to, you know, sometimes who the first owner was, all that sort of stuff. So it's not somebody interpreting it. It's actually just what Ford has or had is their record. So the Marty reports, you know, I'm going to call them unassailable. I'm sure some lawyer out there will, you know, take that to, you know, take offense to that. But they're very, very good records of what your car left the factory at. So if it says it's on a Marty report that it's a uh, 428 motor, you can pretty well take it to the bank that that was the motor the car left the factory with. Okay, so that's another like little nuance here that's probably a good thing to explain, and we'll do this over and over. It's called numbers matching, and basically mm-hmm. what that means is the number on the chassis matches, the number on the engine matches, whatever the hell numbers are out there. And then when you wrong. have this- Oh, wrong, wrong hey, again, Larry. You're going to make me look Jeez. dumb again, Dave? Uh, no, 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 I'm going to school you, though. That's all. Numbers <laughs> I matching got means- Fair enough. No. My numbers matching means just that, uh, that the numbers match. It does not mean, oh boy, are we getting in the weeds now. It does not mean that the motor's not a restamp. So what you really want to know is if it's an original motor. So, uh, oh. you know, there, 
the, you know, every, everybody uses the shorthand numbers matching, but sometimes you can have matching numbers and not have them original parts. So you have to be very, very careful about that. And that's, you know, that's one of those things that, oh boy, could we do a podcast about that for a very long time? But, so uh, the, this Marty report does not mean it's all original parts. It just means it, it's equipped as it lets the factory. Well, it will also tell you what the serial number was, what some of the uh, some of the numbers on, you know, for example, the motor or the rear end or whatever, depending on the car, the year, and everything else. So it's a really good source. Yeah. So we don't we just don't know if this specific car. Or what I'm getting at is perhaps one of the reasons the price is so different is they found that some of those parts that were not as as uh, delivered from the factory. I'm speculating. Well, who knows? Oh, that's a speculation. Who knows? Anyway, this car was a smoking deal. I'll yeah, take I thought it. So too. I don't. I don't care if the if the motor came out of a truck. I'm fine with it at this price. You know, it's so cool. Ah oh, man, why? See, Dave, why didn't you tell me this was happening? Like I could. I did. I could have done something. I sent you the text, but you ignored it as usual. What can I say? <laughs> of course, you know I'm a, I'm a boomer, so my text kind of read upside down and backwards. And uh, maybe I didn't really press the send button. I don't remember. You yeah, know? that's true. You think you're texting, you're not. I don't know what yeah. you're doing. <laughs> yeah, you kids these days. I'm telling you. So, well, there was one that that brought your eye. It was also another Mecham car. Tell us about it. Hey, it's a 2002 Chevy Camaro SS. And this was at Indy, and Indy is still going on as we're as we're. The auction uh, is doing, how long is this? Yeah, it it lasts over a week and two days, I believe. So this was on the first day. I like this car. It's a Camaro SS. It's a 2002 with get this 480 miles on it, and it's got the 5.7 liter, 3.45 horsepower, which means it's an SS. It is also the anniversary model with the 35th anniversary uh, edition. Uh, dash plaque. So it's got a lot. Now, I'm not going to say this was a smoking wonderful deal, but it was a great deal. Um, it sold for, uh, oh, geez, I had it right here in front of me. There we go. It sold for 38.5. Our number one price in the uh, price guide right now is around $43,000. So a little bit of discount there. But I also think this might have the performance package on it, which would make it worth even more. Uh, it is an automatic. That's a downside for a lot of people. Uh, but, you know, talk about a point and shoot, get in and drive car that uh, only from, uh, what, uh, 21 years ago now. It's old enough to drink, um, but it's, uh, uh, you know, a hell of a car for that kind of money. As far as I'm concerned, you're buying a brand new car. Yeah, I mean, you and I are going to have to agree to disagree on this. I mean, the wrapper cars, you know, as soon as you start driving them, you kill the value. I mean, maybe you don't care and that's why you bought it. You want well, it. I wouldn't take name. vanilla ices, but I'd take ice cubes. Oh, different kind of wrapper. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I yeah, tell you, I, the, I get the, it. these. This is another one of those that I have horror stories because we had one at, at a time, and and they had a hundred thousand mile plugs, which said basically you never have to change the spark <laughs> plugs. Yeah, and yeah. I wanted to test some new spark plugs or try them out. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever tried to get like the engine is the like, the dash in these things is like four foot long, and the engine mm -hmm. is completely tucked underneath it, and. Mm -hmm. Getting through the exhaust header and to the spark plug, which of course after eighty thousand miles is now welded to the cylinder head. <laughs> you know, I thought, oh, oh, this is the worst idea ever. So the fact that they're, you know, I my theory with these, Dave, is that just like Camaros in the seventies, they got just destroyed and ratted out. So when you have one that's only four hundred miles, it's such a novelty. It's nobody else has one. It just well, it's it's blasphemy, you say, but that's okay. We <laughs> we can put up with it. I mean, you know, this is just one of those cars that just caught my eye because it was, uh, you know, a pretty decent price on a four hundred and eighty mile. Why why buy buy one with uh, seventy eight thousand miles for you oh, know, half see. this when you can get this thing for, yeah, you know, like I said, uh, you know, thirty eight five. You're gonna you're gonna spend you know twenty two twenty four or something like that on a just a mediocre one. Why not get this? Hey, you can buy a bad one for twelve, no problem at all. But you know, I like it. Yeah, they're well, really the, durable. The powertrain's fun. I mean, especially the stick shift ones. You have this big black cue ball at the top of the shifter. Yeah, they, they really love to do burnouts. I can't believe this, but like the shape is like is looking good again. Oh my god! That means I'm getting to be a boomer. <laughs> no, 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 that'll never happen. So, uh, I, you know, I it's it is an acquired taste. I will say that. And if this is an acquired taste, the Firebird of the same generation is much more of an acquired taste. But I like them both. 
But then again, yeah. I like weird cars, so what? They what did I so many weirdo versions of these things, right? Like that yes. and the Firebird. They had uh, SLP did an edition. I think SLP yep. actually built the SS, or I must have that backward. It's hard to keep track, but those special editions, they come at a premium usually, don't they? Yeah, they usually do, and uh, you know this is a this is an SS, so which makes it, and it's the big motor too. So uh, you know, I, you know, hey, I like it. The heck with everybody else. The one right? that struck my eye that I'd like to talk about, and um, it's it, it sold on Bring a Trailer on the twenty fourth of April. Another low mile car, four hundred sixty eight mile, two thousand and one Ferrari five fifty Barchetta Pininfarina. Now this is basically a five fifty Maranello which was a V12 front engine. You could get it with a stick shift. And this, of course, is a stick shift. It's got all the right stuff. The um, the Barchetta mainly includes a really handsome convertible top and the way it works. This car sold for $720,000. And the reason this was just interesting to me is, you know, a couple of weeks ago, you and I spoke about the Ferrari Dino, uh, the mm -hmm. first generation of the 70s, a 246 Dino, and then the Ferrari Daytona, which is very much like a, 40 year old version of this 550 Barchetta. Mm -hmm. They were flip flop. The the original V12, the Daytona, is going a little bit down in price. And now this thing is worth more than the early 70s car, which I think is a kind of a milestone, if you ask me. Like, yeah, this thing really sold for big money. But, you know, hey, Larry, isn't this a wrapper car with the 480 miles on it or something like that? So defend this one. Well, uh, <laughs> I mean, okay, so you, I see what you're saying. If this had 20,000 miles, you think it'd be worth half a million bucks? Yeah, it'd be closer to half a million and, and maybe even a little less than that. This is huge money for this car. Now, yeah. I, you know, somebody's betting, I think, you know, that this car is going to go up in value and having this one with very low miles on it will make a big difference. Certainly uh, desirable colors, you know, something everybody likes. What, you know, red with black. What's wrong with that? Oh, um, wait, Dave, I got a new idea. This here's our idea. That? Okay, cool. This is what Let's you go. and I are going to do. We're going to mm -hmm. start like an investment fund, right? right. We're going to uh -huh. call it uh, L. Dave Securities LLC. You know, we can't call it Larry David because then that would be confused <laughs> with the Curb Your Enthusiasm guy. Just saying. You know, a little subterfuge in that arena is not bad. I mean, so maybe we should call it that. And then we're just going to buy up any V12 Ferrari built after 1980 with a stick shift. Mm. I, I well, that is that is a can't lose investment strategy, right? You can't you can't argue uh, that. As a person with an automatic, I'm sorry, a F1 transmission in my Ferrari built after 2000, I kind of like it. Doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, Wait, you rather, have one? You have an early because uh, they didn't have DSGs back then. That was a single clutch thing, and the, and the shifts was take the 20 hours. Oh, jeez. Uh, I'm sorry. Now, which which model Ferrari do you have, Larry? Can you tell us all about it? Yeah, I have a Dino. Up. I have a no, Dino. Okay. It's yeah, got okay. nowhere to go but up. All yeah. Right. Okay. So anyhow, long story short, um, I don't mind them with uh, I don't mind with the F1. Doesn't bother me a bit. Uh, I love the look of the gated shifter. I'm not always a fan of the of the shift mechanism in in later Ferraris. Um, it feels a little, as we say, agricultural at times, uh, but. Yeah, teach their own. But you're right. I mean, they've they've been on a rocket sled for a long, long time. I wasn't talking about what you or I like. I was talking about our securities, right? Our little well, investment I like money, fund. So I, I don't want to see it go away. Yeah. So I think people are betting on that. Any of these 550, any of these V12s with stick shifts, because it, this these cars occupy that sweet spot, especially this one. Totally drivable, air conditioning, fun, fast. Yep. They look great. Yep. They have all that classic look with a modern feel, and you still get that analog shift yourself, which, of course, Ferrari doesn't offer anymore. So this is a strong price, but, I mean, now you're seeing here's this car built after 2000 that is trading for more than, you know, vintage Ferrari V12s, which I just think is, I, I mean, what else do you need to know about the current market in that they're rewarding these special cars that are less than 40 years old? That's my point. Yeah, you, and it's a very good point. And you know, uh, obviously, uh -huh. when they uh, when any Ferrari goes out of production, there's no more of them. Generally speaking, unless we're yeah. talking about Enzos, where they decide to make another one or FF or something like that. But we won't go there. But anyhow, what happens is that the uh, uh, you know then the the Ferrari stay decide where in the great pantheon of Ferraris this one stands. 
And this one, you know, a 550 Barchetta is becoming a very, very hot commodity. So, and it you know, wasn't always right. that way. I mean, no, it's no, coming no. back, right? They no, were no, kind no. of, yeah. yeah, they were not looked, they were looked down upon for a while. So this is, so, so I have, I have the first part of our business plan to make a hundred million dollars in the Ferrari business. First, we have to borrow a hundred million dollars. The rest of that business plan is just, you know, it's looking like it's falling into place, right? I thought you were going to front that. I'm going to do PR. I'll be the face of the brand, and I'll, I'll tell do you all what, the I've, buying. How about that? I've got a, I've got a hundred. If you got a million, there we're at a hundred million now, right? So there we go. All right, well, let's move on because I was looking at these upcoming auctions, some of the cars, and I really was thinking of you. <laughs> I just wanted to help you out. There is mm-hmm. a car for sale right now on the Haggerty Marketplace. It's this, and you know, this is what I'm going to eat crow. I mean, these cars I didn't understand, but this thing's pretty cool. It's a Mercedes-Benz 500K replica, and mm-hmm. I know nothing, nothing about this thing. It says it's on a Ford chassis. It's got a Chevy V8. It looks pretty well done, and it was built by um, I the can't classic, remember the classic factory. Yes. What what is that, Mister HT Price? I mean, it sounds like PT Barnum. In 1994, this thing was built. <laughs> yeah, um, there was an era when neo classics were all in. You know, everybody wanted them. Uh, and this qualifies as a neoclassic in some ways. It is more of a tribute car because it does have an actual 540K sport look. Uh, I mean, it's got, you know, it, it's got a good look to it. I don't think this would be um, my ideal car, but it would be a lot of fun to it's own. It's a baller um, car. Yeah, it is. And it looks, I mean, no car looks better in motion than a 540K. Well, uh, wait, can we back SSK, up for a second? So, yeah. The 540K is a pre-war Mercedes, right? Actually, that was a 500K replica, but yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, that car, tell us about that car. Why is the 500K, give us a little backstory for that. Well, how far back do you want to go? I mean, you know, we're talking Listen, about- Listen, I don't have time for all your BS, Dave. Just give me the cliff notes. Two minutes. Holy what do you got? smoke. Well, then I'm done. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't take my BS, then- <laughs> Well, you might as well just call this off. <laughs> Anyhow, um, these were Autobahn cruisers when the Autobahn was first being built. Let's just put it that way. In the 30s, um, right? Yeah. There was this guy. We won't go into him and his name, but he was uh, wanting to, let's just say, dominate the world. And uh, they made some amazing cars. Uh, uh, Mercedes made some amazing cars back then. And they were built for literally movie stars and people in political power and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but they happen to be beautiful cars with just absolutely striking coach work. And this is a you know a replica of that. Um, the good news is uh, it does have some Mercedes parts in it. They say, but nothing you know, from that era. Um, and you know it's a fun car. I have no idea what anybody wants to pay for this. I love the fact that they're out there. This one is not going to be in my garage, but I get to, I get it that for somebody, they'd really love to have it. Yeah, it's super cool. I mean, I think the original car is on the uh, same level as like a Duesenberg or a uh-huh. V16 Cadillac. You know, some of the the supercars of the pre-war era. Right. And I just, uh, I'm really coming around on these things. Uh, just that somebody made a business out of making these things. And this one too, the reason I find it interesting, Dave, is that Usually there's like a massive tell. Like you look at it and you're like, oh boy, that is just like, like a couple of folks got together and their jeans are too close mm-hmm. and it's just deformed. But not mm-hmm. this one. It, it It's proportionally pretty cool, maybe. I mean, it just is, if you want to be stared at going down the road, what else is going to top this thing? I don't know. I don't well, know. Well, you know, talk about the summertime cruising. I mean, you know, top down and fun summertime. Uh, the, you know, I don't know, uh, too much about the build quality of these. I've only seen a few of them. Um, uh, this one looks particularly nice and, and very well cared for. It does. Uh, you know, just from, just from the photos and what I'm seeing. Um, but it's, uh, um, you know, it's a 500 K replica. So that's what it is. One owner from yeah. 94 to 2023. Yeah. 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 Betcha he's a millennial, huh? <laughs> Definitely, no doubt. So um, this car is 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 got twenty days till the auction closes. It's at thirteen thousand five hundred. Somebody's just going to get something really unique and interesting. It's on the uh, Haggerty Marketplace. Uh, next, you you pick the car that that you're looking at, and it, this is a great one. It's that Honda S two thousand. Tell us about it. 
I just love Honda S two thousands. You, you do? Know, they, yes, I do. I love these cars. Uh, are you surprised? Yes. Okay. Am I not supposed to like them? Is that what the, in Larry world or you're trying to tell me here? These cars, it's hard to make sense of these things if you ask me. Really? Yeah. Well, I I think that they're uh, fast, fun, and you know, amazingly uh, well, uh, you know, well trained uh, sports car for not a ton of money. Uh, Honda made a lot of them. They didn't make billions of them. Uh, they raced them. They were successful in racing. Uh, you know, it's a, uh, you know, it's the reliability of a Honda and uh, you know, performance of a Z3. So there you go. Yeah, I mean, this is the early version. I remember when these came out. Uh, two liter engine, two hundred and forty horsepower, no turbo. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it was over two hundred, over one hundred horsepower per liter. I just remember our minds totally blown. But and the, the thing you got to put in context of is that substitution in what you get out of a Miata in like the day to day cruising compared to an S two thousand. The reason I don't like these is the belt line's really high. You feel like you're sitting in a bathtub. Cannot argue with the shifter. And I did a 25-hour race in one of these things, and it was fantastic. It was a CR model. I loved it. They're really durable, all that stuff you say. It, they just left me a little bit like first-gen NSXs. They're just a little too clinical, a little too perfect. And when I think about that substitution, what you can get in the Miata world, either an NC or an ND for similar money, yeah, it makes it hard for me to really love these things. Hey, but this... can I start can I start calling you Larry the Lemming? I mean, is that is that what we are now? I mean, you you don't want to. You, know, you kids these days don't want to expand your mind like uh, you know the boomers I, did. I'm a connoisseur. And, oh, this is the other thing it had. It was one of the first cars with electrically assisted power steering, not hydraulic. Mm-hmm. And you could tell. I mean, on the flip side, right? I I believe these had electric tops, so it was kind of nice. You didn't have to do it on your own, and the build quality and all that stuff. But um, Totally cool, but I guess I'm just a Miata person. But I think to your point, this is on also on the Haggerty Marketplace. It's only at eleven thousand yep. dollars. This one has fifty five thousand miles. It looks really, really well cared for, and they are quick. And they rev to I think nine thousand RPM, and it has this really cool gauge where it it lights up as the it sweeps across the 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 graphic sweeps across the gauge. It has that VTEC system. Do you know what that is, Dave? Yeah, it's a uh, that's a Honda ex- exclusive feature. Right, right. It's two two different cam lobes, and you know when it switches because all of a sudden the the yep. exhaust note goes. Bah! I mean, yep. they are. Exactly. So I guess I am walking back my original criticism, but there's just a lot of competition. There's Boxsters. Oh yeah, re- really fantastic. Hey, 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 hey let, let's let's be honest. Same thing in a Boxster. I'll take the Boxster all day long. Okay, I'm getting worked up again. Yeah, yeah. I know you are. I know you are. Calm down. Take those uh, blood pressure. And these Roadsters, Dave. That the, the essence of driving are these small Roadsters. I mean, it, you can't it, mess around with these things. It's summertime. What's wrong <laughs> with this? Put the top down. Park it in the garage and just don't take it out when it's raining and take it every single <laughs> other day with the top down. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Okay. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, and, you know, and look, some of the competition boxer, you know, run one rings around this in some ways, but I think this is more point and shoot fun than a boxer is. How's that? Well, and you have to, uh, uh, you, you have to recognize like, well, what's really fun about this era was the cars had a lot of different character depending on which country they came from. Yep. And this is a very Honda car, the very Japanese car for all the great reasons. I mean, I'm looking at this picture of the side where the badge is and that panel gap from the door to the fender it's like perfect. Yeah. I mean, the, the build quality on these things really was extraordinary for what they cost. So there I am putting my foot in my mouth again. But uh, I hope I've given you a good picture of, you know, the pros and cons of this thing. But yeah, you made yeah, me store it. So that's worthwhile, right? <laughs> what do you think these things like? Give us a give us an idea of like what they what they're going for these days. I have seen them from literally, you know, like in the teens all the way up to the 30s. Uh, I know exceptional oh cars. Gosh, can, uh, exceptional cars can bring more, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I, it's still affordable. I think this is you know, you can have your Lamborghinis, you can have your Ferraris. We need to talk more about real car, cars that real people can buy, right? I, this is going to be a deal. Is I think what we're all landing on. I mean, and the other thing I forgot to mention is is quite possibly the best shifter installed in any car ever. You see, now you're telling us that you love the car. First you say you hate it, and now now you love it. I mean, 
you know, yeah. you know, usually people charge like 125 an hour for this kind of time, uh, you know, with you on the couch <laughs> and me uh, asking the questions here. So think about that. Uh, you know, therapy for I, almost free. I, I know. I'm just <laughs> like remembering like this thing. Like I said, it was just blowing. I mean, we were just like uh, we were out of our minds at the idea of this car. Uh-huh. And I remember standing around uh, the, the Japanese engineers. I was on the Honda launch for this thing. And I, I was in awe, and I, I wanted to talk to the engine guys. How did you do this? How did you make this engine live and make all this power and rev this high in a, you know, a uh, a, a production car that doesn't cost two thousand dollars? And this, he's probably a boomer, a mm-hmm. colleague, another journalist walks up to these uh, engineers who really were having struggling with English, and with a straight face, he he goes up and he and he, he knocks him. Hey, man. What's this thing got? In it? It's got a V6 or, or what? And like you could see that the Japanese engineer totally understood this, and he just his face just like sunk like two inches. And I just felt so bad and embarrassed for us Americans because how could you not know this is the most na- powerful naturally aspirated engine ever made? I mean, come on. So yeah, that's you know, like, uh, you, know, you didn't even just, laugh you, at that. Okay, you want we can just sit here and beat up on boomers all day long. That's fine. I mean, I <laughs> that was I, the point of that story. I could, yeah. I could take it. I can take it as an official boomer. I could take it. <laughs> you know, I, I'm sorry, but you know, you're not going to get any boomer reaction out of me. So there you go. Okay, this, this is another one. Let's this, this, this is uh, actually a friend of mine here in Detroit owns. It's a 1981. And thank you. Thank you for helping me work through my S2000 issues. I mean, that was a very important moment in my life. Uh, I, I, take, fe- I feel Master lighter Card, than Visa I Master did. Card, American Express. I don't take Discover, just so you'll know. You, you, just said, you can text the hey, numbers to me. I'll, I'll take and, care of it. And let's just keep that whole thing between us. Can yeah, we do that? no problem. Yeah, no one will ever know. Okay, thank you. Yeah, good. Um, there's, it's a Triumph TR7, which I, I do think is is one of the coolest shapes ever, and it's 1981, and this has been converted to V. Wait, why are you laughing? Go ahead, cut me, cut me off at my knees again. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story, okay? So, yes. in the 80s, I owned a parking lot company, and a buddy of mine would come over for lunch every once in a while. He worked at a place called Foreign Imports in uh, Arlington, Virginia, uh, uh-huh. very close to where I live. And one day, he came over with a TR7, and yeah. it had. On the back of it, it had a big hunk of wood that was custom made and a front bumper literally screwed on with a screw gun to the big block of wood on the back. And the reason why was because they'd ran out of rear bumpers. And so they sent a shipment, a shipment of these things with wooden rear bumpers on them. And, you know, we, we were talking Who's about they? Uh, uh, British Leyland. Triumph did? Yeah. The manufactured Yeah, yeah exactly. And so... Uh, you know, you use the word quality on the Honda. I'm going to say that, you know, uh, it wasn't job one for the Triumph people at this era. Now, they've all been obviously babied and fixed and all that sort of stuff. But my forever uh, my forever image in my mind's eye is one of these things with brand new, you know, plywood assembly on the back with a front bumper screwed on because they didn't have any rear bumpers. Yeah, who's being so critical now? Oh, I am. I'm being terribly critical. But uh, let's get on to the show. This is a TR7 that should be a TR8 because a TR8 is a V8-powered TR7, right? I mean, yeah. Okay, let's just back up for a second because this, okay. this is the last model Triumph made, right? The TR7 came with a four-cylinder engine, and the later one was a TR8. Now, there are some, I think, uh, let's say, let's call it like landmark British design cars, right? Uh-huh. We know the uh, the E Type, the Jaguar E Type, was a car that Ferrari said Enzo Ferrari said was the most beautiful car in the world. Reportedly. reportedly, we don't know if that's true. Yeah, exactly. Right? Jaguar was putting out that D Type. Oh my God, the C Type. Yeah. And you know, you could think about the MGs and that classic look, and all kinds of things. And then we get to this wedge TR7 with this really dramatic crease line that sweeps down to the bottom of the front fender from the rear. I just think they're gorgeous. I mean, these are gorgeous cars. Did these blow your mind when they came out? I mean, I was still a kid, of course, but what about you? Let's see. I was uh, walking into the retirement home for the very first time back in 81. <laughs> so, uh, no, uh, yeah, no, they were they were good-looking cars. I actually thought about buying a TR8 uh, two times in my life. I never got around to it. Instead, I wound up with three TR6s over the period of about three years, and I really enjoyed the TR6, which was much more conventional shape. 
uh, you know, more like another a, really cool design. Yeah. Also, like, uh, with the super, uh, with yeah. the six cylinder engine in it, not the right. uh, not the four, not the eight. Anyhow, right. the uh, um, they were revolutionary. I think they sold very well for Triumph. Uh, but this was a company, you know, kind of on its way out of business at this point, and things were not looking real good. Being assembled by basically, uh, you know, communists in the factory who were ready to burn the place down was not a really good, uh, you know, future plan for uh, for British Leyland and the whole Whoa. British car industry. So, yeah. Yeah, so these are the cars. This is the last car. They were junky. But w- what drew me to this, so I actually know the owner. Uh-huh. Really, really good mechanic. He's, this is the second time he's owned the car. It's converted. It was a TR7, and and he installed the V8 from a TR8 or the same engine. It's a it's and, the little Rover engine, right? It's the little Rover that started Which is a as Buick. a Buick. Yeah. Did it start as a Buick or an Oldsmobile? Uh, Buick, I think. Wasn't it? Well, it was a little aluminum V8. Yeah, yeah. That that uh, British Leyland bought from GM. And they put it in everything, right? The Range Rovers had the same version of this Ogen. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, your kids' kids will still be buying the same motor in some car, right? Yeah, it's a good motor. I mean, we did yeah, a thing. Is. If you go to the Haggerty website, our one of our uh, writers, Don Sherman, super smart technical guy, just broke down how great of an engine is. It was one of the better American engines that the Brits actually got the advantage of. But so this car has only got 20 hours to go. It's at $14,000. It's probably the most, out of any TR7, since I know the owner and they always say you buy the owner, he's gone through this thing like with a uh, microscope and a little thing so we could hear every rattle. He's gone through every bit. He works on these things. He's owned a ton of them. So he knows the recipe. I just can't wait to see what this thing goes for because somebody's going to get a really, really fun car that they can just get in and drive for probably not a lot of money because it's not original as you said this has car has a really bad reputation but once it's been through all that this car has been through shouldn't that give the new owner a little more peace of mind oh man i couldn't agree with him more by the owner and uh, you know there's uh, you can see photo in his garage he's got two of them he's got another one there so yeah uh, i mean i think he knows the cars probably pretty well um yeah, I would definitely, you know, all the time you want to buy the owner on the car. And if you're if you're vouching for him, then uh, I know you must be getting a percentage. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, it must be good. <laughs> well, what, are there any things in the photos that tell you, because nobody knows the owner. What I was wondering about, because you're right, like, what is this information I've just passed along does nothing because nobody out there does. But is there anything in the photos that tip you off like, oh, this is owned by somebody who's really knows what they're doing did you see anything like that <laughs> usually it's the stack of bills that tells you that um but if this guy did you know most of the work himself or yeah, a lot of the work did. itself then it's not going to show up it looks pretty clean it is not you know a bring a trailer uh you know show queen uh, by any stretch of the imagination it's a car that's been used and loved um you know we're probably still going to close at fun money for a bunch of people and it's summertime heading up uh you know he, you got to have a convertible for the summer. And if you don't have one, this is the time to grab one. Yeah. I mean, some of the things that I saw in the, um, in the photos was especially underneath, I find those to be the most valuable. Mm -hmm. And especially when you look down, let's say the floor pan of the car from the engine to the rear. And Mm -hmm. usually they'll have like some channels. I don't know what you call those. Um, they're kind of thicker sections that go down. And if those are totally straight, you sort of have to make a judgment call if the undercoating looks original. That's a lot of the little clues that this car has, in my opinion, uh-huh. that really make it one of those where you're like, to your point, well, that's like, not our I, life. I like the blue tartan interior. I think that is oh, m- maximum gosh. 80s, absolutely maximum 80s. So, uh, you know, Bay City Rollers, maximum 80s. How's that? Uh, yeah, I wish I had room. Maybe we had our fun gone. We could have done something with this. Sure. Okay. Well, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, that's about all we have time for. Dave, is there anything else that um, you wanted to talk about this week before we sign off? Well, I think that there's a, there's a lot of opportunities out there in the marketplace, and I think there's going to be even more. I think that, uh, you know, what I- You mean like the Uruquatro? Yeah, well, not only that. I'm, you know, I'm looking at a whole bunch of uh, fantasy cars for me. And there are some really good cars out there. Like what? Give us one. Hey, look, I'm I'm looking at AMG GTs all the time. 
Um, I think that they're a lot of car for the money. You can buy really, really, really decent ones for under a hundred grand. Uh, if you wanted to buy new, uh, there's a couple of cars that really wind my watch that are new as well. So, I, you know, we're, we're one, you know, we always have said this for the last 10, 20 years, and it's been true. We're living in an automotive renaissance and it continues today. There's still new good stuff and there's still plenty of old good stuff out there. And it's a, that, you know, it's a great time to buy something instead of complain, you know, get off my lawn again. Right. God, that's really fascinating because do you remember the SLS, the Gullwing oh, Mercedes? Yeah. Sure. They were cheap for a long, long time. Oh man, you and couldn't then... give them away three years ago. You couldn't give them away. Oh, is that is that how short it was? I thought it was longer than that. It was still three well, years okay, ago. Okay, maybe, you know, hey, when you get old time compressors, what can I say? Maybe it was five <laughs> years ago. But yeah, I mean, you know, they were sitting on dealer lots. Now you see them for four hundred grand all the time. Oh my God, they're that expensive? They can be up to that kind of money, sure. So the AMG T is, you know, it's a more usable version because yep. you don't have that big sill to get in and out. Not as cool. Right. I don't think, I think by the time that car came out, you couldn't get the naturally aspirated 6.2 liter engine, which is a real ripper of a motor, but you did get twin turbos, 5.5 liter, tons of horsepower, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's a, it's a forgiving car that's also a fast car. And I like that. And, you know. Available is coupe and convertible. Uh, frankly, at this point, I'd probably get a convertible. I know that's blasphemy. Everybody wants me you to get would. the coupe. But uh, Green Hell Mango is my color, so you know we'll, we'll, let, we'll let you know what happens. Oh, uh, yeah, they're totally gorgeous cars. I think for me, it's, it's just being excited to get back out there again and enjoy yep. our cars. And yep. I, I think you know what we see, especially with that Mustang from the beginning, was there there is some – Settling after all the hype during the pandemic years when people were just buying and buying and buying and it just sort of drove the price up. But like nothing went off a cliff. It it still remains like such an approachable hobby. Not I mean, the entry price might be high, but if you buy smart, like is what we're here to help you do, you're gonna be okay when you wanna sell it in a couple of years. And the one thing, Dave, you know, that you're heavily involved in, if you go to the Haggerty website, we do this thing every year called the bull market. And these are cars that we uh, predict with, uh, you know, a big knowing that we don't have a perfect crystal ball are either going to remain the same in value or go up a little bit. And mm -hmm. you can go research them. And so we have a list of 50 cars and we do it all the time. Hey, here's a way in. It's a store of money. Yeah, you're going to have to upkeep it. You're going to have to do all that stuff, but it's not going to go to zero. And uh, I know you're always keeping your eyes peeled. So you think AMG GT is one we may have to think about this year. Friend of, friend of mine just bought one. Uh, you know, he uh, looked at all the classified ads he could find, you know, everything online and found a, uh, found a buyer, not too terrible, a seller, not too terribly far from him who, uh, you know, was not a dealer and uh, talked to the guy. The guy says, I'm not, you know, you can't come out here and take a jury ride, all that sort of stuff. So he sent a professional over and looked at the car. The professional called him back on the way home and said, uh, I'm not sending you pictures. And he said, why is that? He says, because the car's basically the brochure car. There's nothing nothing on here that's going to show you that's that nice. Wow. And so, uh, you know, by by drilling down and finding the right car uh, and, and spending the time doing the research, there are a lot of great cars out there. You know, and, and I'm going to say this again. Everybody misses this. We are creating new collector cars every single day. So every day, these cars that become 25 years old or 20 years old or 10 years old, there's more and more of them in the marketplace. So the marketplace keeps on expanding. But guess what? You know, the, uh, the other side of the marketplace isn't saying, no, thanks, I don't want it anymore. Sure, there's some cars that are going down in value, uh, especially for those uh, people who are, uh, what is the name for it? I think we came up with it earlier. Baby boomers, that's right. The boomers. Uh, yeah, exactly. But anyhow, uh, uh, but you know what? There's no cars that are going to zero, and you don't buy the car to make money anyway. You buy the car to have fun. So yeah, that's so the one thing to keep in enjoy mind. It. Yep. Yep, so you can go to uh, Haggerty.com. There's valuation tools. There's all kinds of articles, and you could also visit our YouTube page and and really, uh, if you'd like this show and you'd like to help us out, it'd really be great if you join the Haggerty Drivers Club. We now offer a 60-day free trial, so no risk to you. Dave, it's always a pleasure. Thank you for your counsel. Like I said, I feel so much better this week. I don't know how to thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks, Larry. It was great uh, being on the couch with you. Really appreciate it. All right. See you. Take care. Bye-bye.